Good evening, and this is the first uh, smoking section with uh, Stephen Helfer of the year 2018, and uh, I hope everybody is uh, going to enjoy a year 2018, make all kinds of um, resolutions, and you know, that was, um, that reminds me, I remember one time, I don't know if it was my if it was a New Year's resolution, but I resolved not to give up cigarettes uh, because um, I can't remember what year it was, but uh, <clears throat> I have been going through this period where I had stopped smoking for about, I would say, six years. And, um, you know, I didn't experience any kind of great... Uh, health benefits that were noticeable. I mean, it's not as if I could breathe deeper or get fewer colds. Um, I know I gained some weight, uh, and I think um, I just, did, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't have any benefits at all that I thought might accrue. And, um, but then I got into a situation where I, was with a lot of people who were a kind of um, a lot less abstemious than the kinds of people I had been associating with. And I started to take a cigarette there and a cigarette there and, you know, um, and then I would say, oh, I'm not going to smoke anymore, you know, and it would be, and then it would start smoking, it would stop smoking, it would start smoking, stop smoking. <laughs> it was really very annoying. And, um, you know, a part of me, it was, you know, kind of, it was almost kind of an addiction, this kind of addiction to abstain or this addiction to self-deny, um, you know, what sometimes people might call a positive addiction or something, but you just get into this thing where you really want to deny yourself uh, certain pleasures and uh, you become more, you abstain from this and you abstain from that. Uh, and that in itself is kind of an addiction. Um, so <clears throat> on that New Year's Day, <clears throat> I think it was New Year's anyway, um, I just said I would no longer say to myself, I'm going to quit smoking. I would not call myself that um, indulgence. And um, so I, you know, started smoking again. And um, I will always remember the first day I allowed myself uh, to buy a package of cigarettes. It was like after, uh, it was like um, Christmas, like what I used to feel in Christmas when I was a child. <clears throat> and I was driving up, um, to Killington, Vermont, uh, in my car from Boston, and I could see that package of Camel non-filters on the dashboard of the car, and it was really just like Christmas. I was finally allowing myself to do something uh, that I had evidently, without even knowing it, really missed, and. I noticed that the trip went by so quickly and I think that is because uh, tobacco changes your perception of time. I think particularly if you're someone uh, who is easily bored and I don't know really what causes boredom but uh, if you're easily bored uh, tobacco is very, very helpful, and um, and I think it's part of ADD or ADHD. Uh, those people who really can't do something from a, for a long period of time. And I'm reminded of a another uh, psychedelic or hallucinogen. I guess you would call it hallucinogen. I don't know if that's accurate, but there's this kind of plant that is used by some kind of indigenous peoples <clears throat> where they w allows them uh, to 
stand by a water hole uh, motionless for a long period of time, like I assume that means maybe several hours. And uh, even though they're motionless, their vigilance does not decline. So they're able to react very quickly if something happens that they should or need to react to. Uh, and they take this particular plant, which we would call a drug. Uh, of course, no one really has a definition for the word drug, but... Um, and it enables them to kind of stay for a couple of hours, perhaps, next to the watering hole, and then an animal will come up uh, to drink, and the indigenous person uh, will be able to react and spear or shoot the animal with a bow and arrow or what have you. So I think, <clears throat> I think tobacco is, does that, uh, not to that extent, um, but it helps people uh, stay focused, it kind of eases restlessness and uh, diminishes that uh, state of mind that we call boredom, whatever that is. I think it's pretty hard to really define boredom. Um, you know, the mind is somehow not engaged or is not enjoyably engaged. And so I remember that trip up there to Killington. Previously, any time I took a trip, uh, drove a car uh, for three hours, three and a half hours, uh, it would be painfully bored, boring, but this trip for some reason, well, I think it was because I was smoking. And I think tobacco diminished uh, my boredom, eased my boredom. And I remember getting up there very quickly. And then I remember actually after having started smoking again, <clears throat> you know, where as theretofore I had not been able to sit at a bar and drink and talk to people because I would be so restless. Once I started smoking, I noticed that I could sit still and, and enjoy myself. So that was my New Year's resolution. Um, I think it was probably 1978 or so, <clears throat> around that time. And that's kind of interesting because coincidentally, I'm bringing this up on the show tonight. And... Um, we have the, uh, the blizzard of 1978, which was quite something. And uh, Boston was completely caught uh, unawares. And because it, those, and that was 40 years ago, obviously. We're now 2018. So that's 40 years ago. And at least I've read that uh, weather uh, prediction has um, progressed a lot in the ensuing 40 years. Uh, so in, in 78, the entire city was shut down for three days and everybody had a grand old time. Uh, and one of the funny things that happened in Boston in 78 is that the city outlawed cross-country skiing uh, because so many people were cross-country skiing in the city itself uh, that um, they were interfering, and it was dangerous uh, for the snow removal efforts. So that is probably the only time that Boston has ever outlawed cross-country skiing. And, and they also outlawed private vehicles, uh, unless I, I don't know if that was how hard and fast that was, but you were not supposed to drive in the city of Boston in a private vehicle. Uh, so that was 1978, and that was the year uh, I gave up giving up cigarettes, and uh, I was very successful at it, and, um, and here I am today, 40 years later, and still puffing. And uh, we were talking on uh, uh, the other night on a, um, what's called a video meeting <clears throat> about... Um, smoking and mountaineering. And this video meeting is uh, run by a man named Frank Davis, who runs a blog uh, from Manchester, no, excuse me, not Manchester, Herefordshire, England. And um, we were talking about uh, skiing and, mount, uh, excuse me, smoking and mountaineering. 
and I do a lot of reading uh, about uh, mountaineering and climbing Everest and whatnot, and I've noticed um, that many uh, people who climb, many men who climb these mountains, who originally climbed these mountains, uh, were smokers, uh, either cigarettes or pipes. And, uh, you know, this is something that, of course, uh, today when tobacco is taboo, uh, you would think, oh, you couldn't climb a mountain, you know, a smoker can't climb a mountain. But as a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, the man who is the first person in history to have climbed uh, more than, to a height of more than 24,000 feet, uh, Captain George Fitch, excuse me, Finch, uh, discovered uh, when he was at this very high altitude uh, that, um, that smoking actually helped if you didn't have auxiliary oxygen, oxygen, smoking helped to make it more comfortable, about 24,000 feet. Uh, and this, he uh, wrote about this and lectured on this in the first, one of the very first uh, expeditions uh, to Mount Everest, which was in 1922. Uh, and Everest was not climbed, not successfully climbed, until 31 years later by Edmund Hillary. But there was an article uh, in the British Medical Journal, and um, I will quote from the article, Cigarette smoking proved of great value at high altitudes. At first we noticed that unless one kept one's mind on the question of breathing, that is, made breathing a voluntary process instead of the involuntary process it normally is, one suffered from a lack of air and a consequent feeling of suffocation. A voluntary process must be substituted, and this throws a considerable strain on the mind and renders sleep impossible. On smoking cigarettes, we discovered that after the first few inhalations, it was no longer necessary to concentrating on breathing. The process had become once more an involuntary one. Evidently, some constituent of the cigarette smoke takes the place and performs the stimulation function of the carbon dioxide normally present. The effect of a cigarette lasted for about three hours. So this is uh, quite interesting to me that at high altitudes, uh, cigarette smoking is helpful uh, and that cigarette smokers and pipe smokers and cigar smokers, uh, as most of the men who or did the early climbing uh, in the Himalayas, uh, did not seem to, you know, these days because tobacco is taboo, as I said, Everyone thinks, well, if you're a smoker, you can't be a good athlete. But uh, I don't think that's the case at all. And this article in the British Medical Journal also notes that in 1955, uh, when the first ascent of the Himalayan mountain Kanjenjunga was made, uh, the stores, the Climbers took with them 25,000 cigarettes and 16 pounds of tobacco. Um, this is kind of interesting to me, too, because in uh, polar exploration, uh, the early polar explorers who went to the North Pole and went to the South Pole, uh, tobacco was a very, very important part of their uh, supplies. And as a matter of fact, when Shackleton, who led one of the expeditions to Antarctica, uh, was leading an expedition uh, whose ship got stuck in the ice for oh, more than a year, um, and they had to abandon the ship, uh, he asked all of his men to get off the ship, to abandon the ship, and they could bring almost nothing with them. But one of the things each man could bring with him 
was one pound of tobacco. So the tobacco seemed to be very comforting and perhaps beneficial uh, when, uh, when doing polar exploration as well as uh, climbing uh, to very, very high altitudes. Uh, now, I'm going to try to get to a smoker of the week uh, and another case where tobacco proved very beneficial. And let's see if we can, let's see if I can bring him up. Um, oh, here we go. Well, some of you may recognize this uh, person. And I'll get the phone off. Uh, actually, it's not such a great photo, but it, it's, it will do. And this is the famed modern artist, Spanish artist, Pablo Picasso, uh, who lived to be 92, uh, smoked uh, most of his life. But the real interesting story about Pablo Picasso, and it's uh, in a book of his, or excuse me, a book uh, written by a, a, a biography of his, of him, and when he was born, uh, he was still born. He wasn't breathing, and uh, the the midwife uh, was going to give up on him uh, and give all of her attention to the mother. Uh, because Pablo, little Pablo, wasn't breathing at all. Uh, and his uncle, who uh, was present at the scene, and who was a medical doctor, uh, took a cigar, lit it, and blew the smoke into Pablo's face. And he started coughing, and pretty soon started crying, and came back to life. So without secondhand smoke, uh, Pablo Picasso probably would never have uh, lasted much beyond uh, his early moments when he was born. Uh, and again, he smoked most of his life, lived to be 92 years old, and was probably the greatest artist uh, of the uh, 20th century. So there's a case uh, where uh, Pablo Picasso and where secondhand smoke actually saved someone's life. Now, I've often spoken about taxes on this um, program, but I was happy to see on a, a post that uh, Audrey Silk put up in, um, on Facebook uh, that an organization called the New Zealand Taxpayers Union uh, and incidentally, uh, New Zealand and Australia uh, probably have the most uh, draconian, other than the Philippines, I would say, or possibly Turkey, but uh, most draconian anti-smoking uh, programs anywhere in the world. So the United States is not uh, the worst as far as that goes. And uh, I think one of the reasons is because they're relatively small countries, maybe not in land mass, but uh, in population, and they're kind of isolated. Uh, so the anti-smoking groups there have really gotten a huge amount of power, uh, and it, it's not easy to, to fight them. Um, I mean, I know that, for example, in New Zealand, a law was passed uh, that it is a criminal, uh, a criminal uh, offense uh, to say anything positive about tobacco, uh, at least uh, to broadcast something positive of tobacco or to print something or publish something. I mean, that sounds hard to believe that uh, an English-speaking country with, you know, even though they don't have a First Amendment like we have, uh, that certainly freedom of speech is held high. But in this case, the government of New Zealand has said tobacco is so taboo that you can't even talk about it so that, for example, I would be, I could be put in jail for this program. Of course, I think there are people probably in this country who feel I should be put in jail for this country program, but, um, so the New Zealand taxpayers um, 
organization has really been put out a report. It would probably be a pretty interesting to report, but um, they are saying that the average smoker, if a person smokes one pack a day uh, in New Zealand, uh, that that person is probably uh, spending about $2,000 in taxes. And New Zealand plans to even raise these taxes higher. Um, and like we've pointed out here many times, uh, that poorer people tend to smoke a lot more. The rates of smoking among poor people are a lot higher than affluent people. So, you know, not only is this tax a frightfully regressive tax, it's even worse than a regressive tax because it's aimed at poor people. It's not just a tax that hits everybody and affects poor people more than rich people. It's a tax that really only falls to a large extent on poor people. Uh, and they point out this in this report that um, for a lot of people in New Zealand, particularly um, indigenous peoples who have very high rates of smoking relative to the rest of the population, um, this is really cutting into the money that they need for rent, for food, for medical care, and the like. But of course, as we talked about on this program many times, uh, the anti-smoking campaigners uh, are so committed to this uh, ideal of stamping out smoking that there is nothing, uh, no amount of pain inflicted on people are uh, pushing people into poverty or, for example, forcing the elderly to go out and weather like we have now to smoke. Uh, nothing uh, do they feel is going too far. Um, and uh, in New Zealand, they, uh, the government still plans to raise the taxes continuously, to raise the taxes 10% uh, each year uh, right up through 2020. Uh, but hopefully, uh, cooler heads may prevail, or maybe, you know, in the medical profession, uh, there is, a, in the Hippocratic Oath, there is first do no harm. And this is something that is being done uh, in the name of uh, health and so forth. So you would think that uh, the first thing would be first do no harm and that you are for inflicting that much pain and discomfort and actually impoverishing people. Uh, somebody in the medical profession would, or someone who is speaking in the, for the medical profession would say enough is enough. Uh, how far do you go uh, to promote this uh, anti-smoking fervor? Uh, likewise, in New York State, the amount of uh, contraband cigarettes that were um, confiscated or tobacco uh, in 2017 was about $6.6 .6 million worth. So evidently in New York State, which has the highest tax rate in the United States, there is tr tremendous smuggling going on. Thanks for watching the smoking section. Please tune in next week.